Yeah, OBS just just destroyed. It just crashed. So I'm going to go to the intro hold and we're going to pretend I'm starting over. All right, everybody, I'm back. Uh, I have no idea what happened before. Um, so we'll just kind of go over the, the topics that I covered uh, and start over. That was really weird. It just started dropping frames, and then it just like exponentially started dropping frames. I've never seen any air like that. But anyway, we're back. We did it. Always frustrating to have to restart like that, but let's go. Uh, so... Here's a real quick catch up of what we discussed. Hopefully no drop frames this time. So Xbox has reached an agreement with Crash Bandicoot and Spyro Devs Toys for Bob for their next game. The rumor is that this is actually going to end up being a Spyro the Dragon game based because they said, keep your horns on. But uh, apparently the agreement has been reached. They were a little bit cagey about what they were revealing. That is from Jez Corden. Jez Corden also talked about how an Xbox prototype for a handheld is in the works. This is a new prototype, not the old prototype. 
And this is from their podcast as reported by Tom Henderson over on Insider Gaming. So that is cool news. I think Xbox going into the handheld market is is an interesting topic. And here's the thing. If you look at what The Verge said about it when they did all the news, Microsoft teases ultra-powerful next-gen Xbox and maybe a handheld. The Xbox maker is working on a unique hardware and a next big and a big next gen technical leap. So there was already a theory that this could have potentially been a handheld and it seems like it's getting a little bit more credibility in the journalistic space <laughs> as Jez Corden is saying that they've made a Xbox handheld prototype. And that's great. Gamer Citadel says, hey man, Hope all is well. Question, what would happen if a game developer put you in a self-defense situation? Would you put them in a chokehold? <laughs> what? Uh, I mean, hopefully I never end up in a self-defense situation with anybody. Um, I would probably just leave the situation. Yeah, you can usually just walk away from 90% of things. Uh, like, if somebody's that unhinged, then you just leave. I'd probably do an arm bar. I would go for the arm bar. That would be... <laughs> and then I'd be like, you got to tap out, bro. We're not going to do this. That's an interesting question, but thank you for the... <laughs> thank you for the tip. Yeah, armbar. Uh, so there was a blog post. There's just not a ton of Xbox news, but the, the two exciting ones were that Toys for Bob gets to continue making games and the the report from Jez Corden talking about how Xbox could enter the handheld market. Now, this last week was GDC. And EG, GDC means that there's a lot of developers talking about the state of the industry and what's going on. And there are a lot of these stories that we're going to talk about going forward are from that or about the Bungie thing, which we're going to get into in just a second. So uh, Xbox put out this blog post about how they're going to help uh, continue helping independent developers reach more players, which is always a great thing. Greetings from GDC. Every year we use this show as a way to meet tons of developers as a convenient check-in to talk about the goings on at ID at Xbox 2024 got off to a fast start with players this year. Xbox had its biggest month ever on console this past January measured by playtime, including ID at Xbox program member pocket pair whose Xbox game preview title Power world has more than 10 million players on Xbox so far. Now, if you click into this link, are they just talking about Xbox? They're talking about game pass, right? Because Xbox, the company, Microsoft, refers to Xbox, <laughs> the platform, right? And that's, I got in trouble with the, the Death Stranding comment because I kind of adopted that. And people were like, oh, it never came out on Xbox. It came out to the Xbox ecosystem. It counts. Uh, God, let me take, God Emperor, let me take a look into that. Dev Kit South Korea Xbox. New X, this is from Tom's Hardware. I use Tom's Hardware for like uh, stuff. Breaking news, everybody, as of four days ago. New Xbox dev kit certified. Oh my God. Certified for testing in South Korea. Console refresh could come this year. I talked about this on the last episode. So it's console model 2089. This is what, this is what a dev kit looks like, right? I've seen these during behind closed doors demos and such. And I do kind of want to talk about this for a second because do I think this is a console refresh? Maybe not, but I hope I'm wrong. Why? Because I talked about it on the last live stream. I said that Xbox needs to have an answer for GTA six. They have to have a console of some sort for people to buy for GTA 6 specifically, right? So the Xbox dev kit certified for testing in South Korea, console refresh could come this year. I think that would be refreshing. And 
Eat Fresh Guy talked about Gear 6, Fable, Perfect Dark, Elder Scrolls 6, Fallout 5, Blade. They are going to have to do a console refresh at some point. And I am curious, like the Xbox Series S, let's be honest, I feel like that console is kind of nearing the end of its life cycle. I don't know how Xbox can continue to enforce parity with that platform. That platform is very powerful. It's a great platform. But like at some point, with what Unreal is doing with their engine and stuff, it's got to get left in the dust, right? I imagine. That's just my take on it. But like, like a year ago, I'm like, yeah, you can still kind of get away with it. But now, uh, <laughs> I don't know. I like by the time GTA Six comes out, I think the Series S needs to needs to be reconsidered. It is not pre-recorded, anybody. This is all live. Yeah, so um, 2025 to 2026 was the window for next gen. Yes, that is correct. In the leaked FTC documents, that's what they discussed. Lucius says, this is a terrible take. All right, Lucius, why is it a terrible take? Why is the idea that GTA 6, a game that Microsoft is going to say needs to have parity on Xbox Series S, why is it a bad idea to say, hey, maybe by the time GTA 6 comes out? It's going to have to be a conversation at one point, though. Do I want the Xbox Series S to be dropped? No. Do I think Microsoft's going to need to make that consideration when GTA 6 comes around? Uh, I, I think they're going to have to make a, a consideration for it because if the current generation consoles can't, are going to be, they're running at 30 FPS and Digital Foundry is talking about how GTA 6 is likely not even going to go to 60 FPS on the PS5 Pro, then I am curious how the Xbox Series S is going to fare. The Xbox Series S, okay, let's, let's look at it from another perspective. They keep the Xbox Series S on board and they continue making developers have their games run in the Series S. At some point, those games are going to run poorly or just not be able to keep up. But thinking on it, maybe maybe a strategy similar to what happens with Switch, a strategy where things come out on the current gen hardware first and then the Series S later when they're able to optimize it for that platform, then maybe that could be a solution where everybody kind of ends up happy, right? Like if you're a Series S owner, okay, like my hardware is taking longer, but I still get it. I don't know what they do. I don't have a good answer for this one. But I like Xbox made Larian release Baldur's Gate 3. What did that mean? It mean it means that Xbox gamers got Baldur's Gate 3 way later than PlayStation gamers. Why? Because they couldn't optimize for the S. Now, Larian did talk about how having to do that allowed them to improve the game for everybody. So that's kind of good news. But at the same time, it just means you get games later on all Xbox platforms. So I am a little curious, like what's, it's a really difficult question, actually. Like, I don't know what the right answer is. I'm just sort of talking out loud and thinking it through. I, th I don't think they should drop the platform, but I do think that we're going to start seeing releases happen later on the series S or something. Xbox is going to have to give some wiggle room there. Otherwise the entire ecosystem is going to suffer is what that's my sort of thought on the whole thing. I don't really know. I'm just kind of working through it now because somebody brought it up. Do you think it's a bad look if sea of thieves runs better on the PS five pro? No, like why, why would it be a bad thing if the six seven hundred dollar box that is like the current latest and greatest runs a game better than the previous generation that came out like four years ago i don't think that's necessarily bad and there have been a lot of talks about how the games run better on playstation and stuff like that um i haven't really looked into it hey brett good to see so many members by the way uh full disclosure i feel bad about the the channel last few days i have been struggling to get content out 
but I, I have committed to doing the, the long form stuff and the live streams on Sundays. That is something that I don't plan to drop in the near future, but I have been struggling with the, the news updates regularly. So good to see all the members. I really, really appreciate you. And I do realize that I have to get back on my news cadence. It's just, it's been difficult. I've been having sort of a tough time in terms of, uh, not feeling hundred percent. I, I still have a cold. Like, I don't know why I can't shake this stupid thing. <laughs> and uh, work-life balance has been tricky with all the, the previews and such. But I'll get back at it. Just saying apologies, y'all. Yeah, man. I don't know what to do about the Series S, though. Just thinking about the Series S. Uh, I'm not really sure what they do. I feel bad for the members though, because they're they're monetarily supporting the channel, right? I owe it to them to keep going and to to keep making content, and uh, that's not something that I'm I'm comfortable with. Like, it's my job, right? <laughs> Andrew C. Well, thank you, Andrew. I do appreciate. It. I do appreciate you having my back. Oh, I will say this: I have no plans to ever stop making gaming content, ever. No matter what happens, this channel's not going anywhere. I mean, unless there's some legal thing that made the channel go away, but I don't think that's going to happen. But like, I will not stop making gaming content. So if you follow me, you support me. How long have I been doing it now? I, I like my first real job in the industry. I just got the email. It was in 2008. I got an email about working at Screw Attack way back in the day, right? And I did hard news. I did that for three years over at Screw Attack. I think I started in 2008 or 2009. So I've been doing this for a very long time. We're going to be nearing 20 years. If I, if I can keep doing this and support my family, there is no reason I will do anything else. I love doing this. I love talking about games. I've always been about the consumer and I will never, ever, ever change that perspective. At the end of the day, I think what Microsoft is doing and the reason I've been so pro Xbox on this channel is I think what they do is very pro consumer from Xbox Game Pass. The meme about Xbox Game Pass having a ton of games available to you. I think that is very pro consumer at the end of the day. Uh, they they force PlayStation to up their game. Now, PlayStation gamers get a better selection because now PlayStation Plus has become something much greater than it originally was. There are things that they do. Like, I don't think I disagree about games needing to be $70. We've talked about that ad nauseum on the channel for like a year. When games are bad, like uh, Redfall. Redfall was a disaster. So, yeah. That's right. I did Dale. The whole Xbox game pass meme was me every once in a while. I bring it back, but yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm totally off on a tangent now. I forgot what we were even talking about. We were talking about Xbox series S and, and everything, but yeah, PS5 pro only eight 99. Oh my God. Who, if it was that price, we're going to go over the games industry biz article on that, but let's get through a few more stories. So, uh, there was the rumored hardware. Uh, that's kind of cool. I hadn't seen that. Maybe I'll make a video about like all the Xbox rumors are these Xbox rumors are amazing. I think that'll be like one of my news videos that I make. Um, and just real quick, just a real quick side about ID at Xbox. So I, I did the, I had the very fortunate opportunity to work with the ID at Xbox team to make a, live stream over on IGN to highlight the X, the ID at Xbox games. And it was awesome. Like it was, it was just great to have that opportunity for IGN to make the live stream for ID at Xbox games, because these are indie developers or smaller developers that need as much attention as possible. And this is one of the games I we highlighted. I believe, I believe this got cut from the overall live production, but this was one of the games we got to talk about. It was coming to game pass for the first time. I'm blanking on the name of it off the top of my head. But yeah, and it, it's a really good game. Anybody know this game off the top of that? Let's let's get the image name. Sea of Stars. Sea of Stars. Really, really solid game. It was on Game Pass day one. And it is just great to see games like Stray, Raji, like 
all of this stuff that people get to tr try and see if they connect with gamers and they're going to continue making interesting games. I'm also sort of curious about this one. I can't remember the name of it. What is it? Venba. I have heard a bit about Venba. Venba looks sort of intriguing. I'm down for playing anything a little bit when I get the time in between, you know, Dragon's Dogma 2 and the 40 games that came out this week. But it is great to see that Xbox is recommitting to helping developers make games. And that's sort of been at the heart of what they're about, right? So I'm I'm a longtime follower of Xbox and how they they help indie developers make their games. When I was in college, you know, they were one of the platforms where it's like, hey, it's pretty easy to get a game out on Xbox. They there have been a lot of stories that have come out about how they really work with smaller developers. And that was at a time when PlayStation wasn't so good at it. So PlayStation hopefully got their stuff together and has figured out how to do better promotion for indie games and such. But Xbox has a whole branch ID at Xbox to this initiative. And that's really heartening to see, honestly. And I, I really do appreciate that Xbox takes that initiative and puts in the effort to make sure that indie games are able to come there. So not only do they do all this pro consumer stuff, but they have uh, Game Pass deals where they'll help fund games to get out the door. They have the indie program ID at Xbox that allow people to make games that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. And they are one avenue where you can get your games out. I have seen some stories about how some people don't like this, and I would like to dive into that a little bit more. But for the most part, I, I do think all of this seems like a big win to me. And going back to the Toys for Bob story, when they when they make the decision to say, hey, look, we can close Toys for Bob or we're going to give you the option to go independent and then Toys for Bob go, goes independent, what does Xbox do? They say, we want you to make Spyro for us. They don't say it outright, but like that's stuff that you can get behind. You can't really get behind laying off 1,900 people or 900 people at Sony and all the disastrous layoffs. Like that's stuff that they should be called out for. But there's a lot of good stuff, too, that has happened over the years. And that's why it's hard for me to get too riled up about anything going on over there. And and honestly, for say what you will about PlayStation, uh, based on the Bungie news that we got this this last week, I'm kind of glad Jim Ryan's out and Hiroki Totoki's in because it seems like he's calling out leadership at Bungie and saying, you got to get it together. You're the problem. It's not your workers. Look at what your workers have created. Look at what all these people have created. What are you doing as leaders? You're failing your people. And maybe we should jump over to that now. But um, yeah. Yeah, let's jump over to the Bungie story now because I'm a little riled up about it. It has been on my like, I want to talk about this all week story. Um, if you haven't been following it, basically, I'm going to tell you what I know about the Bungie story. I have heard that... Bungie leadership basically ended up doing the layoffs. And this is, this isn't corroborated. This is like one source, but I have heard that it's to keep their nest egg and get their golden parachutes to get out of the company. And then, then there's going to be this like max mass exodus of leadership who is repeatedly failing the employees. And it is incredibly frustrating. Now, if you don't know, the contract basically says they get a bunch of money if they go to 2026. So, yeah. And check this out. Bungie replaces Marathon director amid leadership shakeup, fears of layoffs. Former Valorant game director Joe Ziegler is replacing Christopher Barrett. Christopher Barrett has been a staple of Bungie for years. And... To see him shoved aside, so to speak, so that Ziegler can come in and do this, it's strange. This is not a slight against Ziegler. This is not a slight against Barrett. Something's going on. And it stinks. Ziegler said, hey, everyone, fun update. For the last nine months, I've been working on Marathon as the game director. We're still baking, but I'm excited to share with you more info on the game as we get closer to bringing it all to you <coughs> and check this out. 
the rumor is that they have pivoted to a hero shooter, which nobody likes. They laid off 100 people last year, late last year. They've been criticized by Sony. And what I've heard is that Sony is pissed about how they have been handling things. Like they didn't need to fire those people. It just didn't seem necessary. And if we go back even further, somebody told Sony that they would make 45% more revenue than they did. They missed by 45%. It's insane. It is insane what is happening at Bungie. I I personally, I got to sit down with Pete Parsons when I was at IG. Sorry, I'm still at IGN. So with IGN, I got to go visit Bungie. And then I got to interview Pete Parsons. And he talked about how excited they were to go independent, the future of their studio, how they were u- utilizing that interview to say, hey, you should come work for us. Fast forward like two years they get acquired by Sony fast forward a year. They lay off a hundred people. I mean, and then you got like former employees talking about <laughs> how they're not happy with upper management. Well, where does that go? It's real bad. And Sony is calling them out too. So you got Sony calling them out. You got employees calling them out. It's not a great place to work. And Well, it seems like right now it's not a great place to work. So to go from like one of the most uh, highly regarded places in the industry to where they are now is it's a shame. And check this out. If Christopher Barrett was swapped out nine months ago, I never had a chance to get a job at Bungie Clay. Uh, If uh, Christopher Barrett was out nine months ago, that means one month. Paul Tassi caught this one month after they revealed Marathon with Christopher Barrett at the helm. He was removed from that role. What is happening? And the rumor is that everybody's, it's just a rumor, can't corroborate it. But I mean, if you go read the article on IGN, it doesn't sound great. IGN has reached out to Bungie for comment on whether or not Barrett will remain with the company. Bungie has not yet responded to IGN's request for comment, but shortly after we reached out to Ziegler, he confirmed his appointment as the game director on X slash Twitter. So this article was coming out. They reached out to him and he's like, oh yeah, hey, I'm the game director. Chris Barrett, he's been tweeting stuff, but it's, it's, it's stinky. To say at least, say it the least. To put it mildly, I don't know why I said it that way. Well, this is going on. Sources tell IGN that Bungie is pouring resources into getting Marathon out the door. The game's direction has shifted somewhat under Ziegler's new leadership. One source says, including moving away from custom player characters in in favor of a selectable cast of heroes, it's dead. There's just no way Marathon comes out. And it's amazing. It's like the best thing ever played. We also have all these reports that people who play it don't like it. The overwhelming feedback has been Clay banned Mr. Fox. The overwhelming feedback has been that um, it's not liked. So everybody who's played Marathon has said negative things about it. They like restarted or or are changing things internally. So yeah. K the Barbarian. Some people said K the Barbarian is clarifying with me, and he's right. That's not true. They liked it, but simply said they wouldn't leave their current game to play it. Some people said they liked it, but wouldn't leave their current game to play it. But the overwhelming consensus from what I've heard is that it wasn't that great. Like they're like, yeah, it's okay. And here's the thing. Bungie doesn't need an okay game right now. They need something that gets every player from destiny 
to start playing marathon. And that's not going to happen. Nine Live says Sony overpaid for Bungie. You know what? Uh, who do we have on the channel? Somebody on the channel said that. We interviewed uh, Michael Pactor. And Michael Pactor said the exact same thing. And I think he's right. They did overpay. And the second I knew they overpaid is when they had the 45% revenue miss. They had inflated numbers from COVID. And it's biting them in the butt. Rev continues, well, upcoming Destiny 2 expansion, the final shape is also being prioritized. There are growing fears and rumors that layoffs will immediately follow its release. One person with knowledge of budgets at Bungie told me that nothing adds up and something will need to happen to curb costs unless the final shape does so well to cover the gap and people can move to Marathon. There's no way that happens. They have So basically what needs to happen is Destiny 2, the final shape needs to be a massive success and Marathon needs to be a massive success. Do you know how unlikely that is to happen? Incredibly unlikely. I I think let's look at let's look at Steam charts. So Destiny 2 just had a big event, right? Destiny 2 for years has been in the top 10. Let's see how it's doing right now. It's not even in the top 25. Did I miss it? I have never seen Destiny fall below the top 25. Top 33. So let's look at the last year. Constant decline. This is the Guardian Games event where you can get a cool hoverboard. I I actually went pretty hard on that. 74K, 52,000. Like these numbers are still good, but are they the biggest company in the world good? I don't know, man. Let's look how it compares to their usual numbers. It's about half their average. Their peak was 316. They're never going to hit. So they hit 316 with Lightfall. I don't know, man. I Never count Bungie out. I will say that. Because even look at this. This is January of last year. That's one. That's their highest concurrence ever. I think that was Lightfall. Sorry, the graph's so small. 316. And then they've kind of had these peaks and valleys. And right now they're actually having a peak for March because they had Guardian Games. And they want you to keep playing their game. And Guardian Games was very grindy to get that stupid hoverboard. I had to watch. The way I did it was I watched all the live streams. Good to see you, Infinite. Good to see you, Andrew. I watched the live streams and then I would uh, cash in my diamond. And that gave you 300 a week. But I had to do it every week. So like their whole retention, they're still in the retention metrics phase. Here, one second. I'm going to go get something. You know what? They actually sent me something and I've been waiting to open it. Be right back. I just didn't want y'all to see my sweatpants. <laughs> uh, so they actually sent me this and I haven't opened it yet. Do you want to open it now? Well, say what you will about Bungie. A lot of people who worked on this game put a lot of work into the final shape. This is my last hurrah with Destiny. I'm done after final shape. I am absolutely done after the final shape. Absolutely. Haven't opened this yet. They sent it over. I know there's a bunch of unboxing of these things already. There are a bunch of unboxings online of this already. But yeah. And I thought about it. I think I'm going to do the montages. I have them all cut. I went back through. I recapture all Lightfall. I know Ch Chez V says I can utilize the stuff that I missed. So I do think I'm going to finish out the montages. Where's the statue going on the shelf? You can help me pick. All right. So we got the plastic off. Don't want to fingerprint it up. Final shape. How many of y'all in chat are actually going to play this? 
I know we're off on a like a super tangent right now. There aren't too many Destin unboxings. Well, this one's not gonna be any better. Normally I would like mount a camera on the ceiling so you could see everything, but whoa. No, most people aren't gonna play it. Final shape. Burp, burp. I don't want to get y'all y'all's hopes up, but I am. Well, no, I'll just I'm not gonna say anything. You'll have to wait on any fire team chat news. <laughs> I don't wanna get people's hopes up and let you down. How do you open this? There's a letter coming out here. So you get some sort of letter. Guardian. I have traveled much recently looking for records that might shed more light on our foe. This is the best way I can help you. Lacking significant combat expertise. This is from Ido, scribe of the House of Light. I don't think we've heard it from Ido since like the early games. I've covered I've covered Dest Destiny for like a decade. How do you open? Okay, yeah, it's one of those things. Okay, so the front kind of goes like this. Burp. Oh, that's cool. Look at that. That's pretty nice. It's like a nice Vanguard book. That's pretty cool. I won't focus on this too long. I know a lot of people are here for news. And this is really nice. This is like a leather finish. It's very, it feels nice. And it's got the cool gold shiny thing on it of the tree. And that's it. That's the whole thing, right? There's nothing else in here. Just kidding. So, so the main thing that you get with the collector's edition is this. It's a tower. I personally think that this is not the best collectible that they could have included. I think it's kind of dull personally, but that's that's what it is. I do greatly appreciate uh, Bungie or whoever said to send that to Destin. But I don't really understand the significance of it right now. It makes noises and stuff. I'll show you in a second. Yeah, it's like, think about design wise. If it was just this top part, that's cool. But this is just like a box. Right. So I, I don't really understand, like if it opened or something like that, and then you could see all the different layers, that might be cool. But I don't know if it's charged. I don't know how to make it make noises. It's supposed to make noises. There's some other like little trinkets in there. Yeah, I don't like to poo-poo on it because it was sent to me and it was very nice of them to send it to me. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, yeah, I think this doesn't... There's a reason I didn't pre-order this one. <laughs> the Ghost was the best one they ever did for Destiny 1. And they did the uh, the Creepy Ghost. Okay, so when you put these little things on there... Yeah. I don't know. It's supposed to say something, but I don't have it charged right now. I do have a charger that I keep plug into my pc let's see if this will work this is my headset charger that i use all the time i'm glad people are sticking around for my unboxing all right okay so it should work it's plugged in no nothing do whatever you're supposed to do is there a button zero out of ten i don't know how it works <laughs> Yeah, like these guys are supposed to make a noise. I've seen other people open it. Which Bungie do you like better? Halo Bungie or Destiny Bungie? If one had to be erased from history, which one would you keep? That's a really tough question. I can't pick, honestly. Is there a button on this thing? Does anybody know? Is there a button? Ikora in front is all in the back. This panel moves? Oh, does it actually open? This panel moves. Is that supposed to move? This one doesn't move, just this one. I'm like going to break it 10 seconds after getting it. 
Well, I have no idea how to make it make noise, but there, there it is. You hear that? Anyway, I didn't mean that. <laughs> I'm like losing viewers because I want to play as my dumb toy. Do they go up here? Is there a button? All right. I give up. I'm an idiot. But there is a panel back here that moves for some reason. It looks like it's on a swivel. Read instructions. There's no instructions. Should I like... I'm there's a button here, maybe? Well, it's going to be a mystery, everybody. <laughs> There's, there's lights down here, too. I don't even know how to turn it on. I miss Fireteam Chat. Aw, thanks, man. There's no button. Oh! So the button's here. There. See, I told you, you just let me hammer on it long enough. I'll figure it out. It's supposed to do something when you put the... Okay. What? I thought these guys did something. I don't, I thought these guys did something. All right, well, there's the tower, everybody. Yay. I don't know where these little guys are supposed to go. I also don't know their significance. It looks like Zavala and Ikora. All right. I'm done. Done playing with the toy. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I think the tower's like whatever. That's my hot take. Is there anything else in here? Oh, there's a charging cable for it. Whoop! Comes with a charging cable. Don't know Jace is reading the instructions. Oh! There are instructions. Oh, there's a mode button over here. Somewhere. Power button, mode button. Where? We found the instruction. The instructions were like in the bottom of it. It says the mode button's like back here, but there's no button to press. There's no like clickable button. It says it's here, but that's not like a button or a toggle. Oh, well. What's this? All right. Just some tracking device. No big deal. All right, so that's that's the Destiny Collector's Edition. How much is this thing? How much does this thing cost at retail? Somebody donated fifty dollars. No, I didn't. I think I would have saw that. All right, so that's Destiny's Collect. It's two hundred dollars. That's nuts. I've been meaning to open it anyway. Oh, here here's the mode button. Whatever that is. All right, so power and mode. Does it do anything? It just plays like a tinny. 
It's $275, everybody. What? What if I press it again? What is it doing? Wait, what? <laughs> like, do you hear the, the audio quality? It's so, like, tinny. Well, I'm never getting anything. <laughs> oh, I really hate this $275 thing they sent me. I'm very thankful. I don't think they've ever... They've never sent me a collector's edition before. You know who got the collector's edition of Destiny 1? Greg Miller. I got to open it with him, at least. Anyway, let's look at the lore stuff. So, this book is really nice. Okay, you can just shut up. That's enough. Stop. How do I turn this thing off? All right. So this is the lore book. This is the good stuff, right? Oh, okay. Like there's good stuff in here, but it's just, oh my God. Did they all sign it? There's a bunch of signatures in here. It's from Scarex, <laughs> Nix. Oh, uh, this is kind of cool. So one of the first things I, I ever did in the industry was I entered a contest for Halo 3 and like the entire Bungie team signed it. And I, I do like stuff like this. It kind of reminds me of that poster. I still have it in the garage somewhere, but um, it still reminds me of that poster where everybody signed it. Like the biggest shame about Bungie is the, the team behind the game is like one of one of the best teams and they really, really care about making an amazing game. And uh, the people they hired to work on Destiny 2, who they ended up playing off, it's just like, just unfortunate in my opinion. So there are some blank pages. Oh, they have the spicy ramen ticket, like a physical one. Th this is cool. Greg, the biggest Destiny fan. <laughs> now that they have Ghostbusters content. So there's blank pages here. I wonder if this is like a black light thing. There's definitely. There was a there was a Halo 3 Easter egg. There's like four blank pages here at the end. I bet you if I had a black light, there's something on those pages. So that's cool. I, I that is a very lovely book. I don't know how to close these things. I don't I'll have to ask Miranda. Hey Miranda, how do you close the fancy books? She does all sorts of uh, craftsy stuff. And then what do we got here? Classified report. It's got some uh, patches. Is Destiny over now? Destiny is believed to be ending after Final Shape. Oh. And then it's just a book. There's a lot in here. There's like it's like a whole story. I'm gonna have to read it all later. But anyway, that is the the two hundred and seventy five dollars collector's edition. Uh, here's my review on it. I don't love the tower. I don't really. Tower is not my favorite. I really really love the booklets and stuff like that. I think like hardcore. I know Bife's gonna be doing a reading about the booklets, so I think that's cool. Um. I really do appreciate PR <laughs> sending it over. I'm sorry that I kind of roasted it, but uh, I do like the, the leather bound stuff. I'm just being honest. If I paid $275 for that, I just don't think it's a good collector's piece. You know what would have been a great collector's piece? Like, I guess it would have been a little tone deaf to do Zavala, right? But something like a figure or... One of the iconic, we oh, the weapon that Cade uses, that would have been perfect. Or a Cade bust. I don't know. The tower, something's, tower's going to explode or something. That's my guess. Anyway, we were talking about Bungie falling apart. 
and then I got distracted. Let's get back to the layoffs at Bench. <laughs> well, up <laughs> well, upcoming Destiny 2 expansion, the final shape is also being prioritized. There are growing fears and rumors that layoffs will immediately follow its release. One person with knowledge of budgets at Bungie told me that nothing adds up and something will need to happen to curb costs unless the final shape does well to cover the gap and people can move to Marathon. Uh, yeah, so here's the thing. Uh, leadership has put themselves in a position where they needed to sell to PlayStation to continue going. And they've said that publicly. And now they're in a position where they've missed revenue after selling to PlayStation and they're in danger of being shut shuttered. There's the Gummy Bears IP, who knows what that is, and there's the Matter IP. Matter was canceled and restarted, then canceled, and Gummy Bears is in a holding pattern due to ongoing company struggles. Yeah, like you just fired 100 people. They need to get Final Shape out the door, and it needs to be spectacular. By the way, I just realized there's no game code in here or anything. So do you get a copy of the game with the Collector's Edition? I didn't see a game code in there. There better be a code in here somewhere that I missed. That would be insane. You do not get a copy of the game. There's no way, chat. There is no way. Oh, here's a emblem code. No, you got a copy of Destiny 1 with the Destiny 1 Collector's Edition. I want to go back and watch my unboxing on IGN where I lose rock, paper, scissors to Greg and he gets the stupid ghost. I want the ghost. He still has it on his shelf. <laughs> I know he still has that ghost around in the studio somewhere. Anyway. You don't get the game. Wow. We're going to get to the corporate greed thing in just a second. Bungie has found itself rocked by a number of major shakeups in recent years that have tanked morale at the Destiny studio and left its future on certain Sony officially required the studio mid-2022. Michael Pactor saying they overpaid. It seems that would be accurate. With the promise, it would largely retain a semblance of freedom as the independent subsidiary, while well, sources say that's largely remained true, Bungie has struggled to meet key financial targets Destiny 2 significantly underperformed last year. In October, Bungie laid off 100 of its then 1,200 employees. Do you remember the day before the layoffs happened? I released a video saying, Dear PlayStation, are you okay? Because they had gotten rid of Connie Booth, who we're going to get to that story in a second. And then <laughs> Bungie laid off the 100 people. However, sources at the time also told IGN when leaders were asked if they had to consider taking pay cuts prior to making layoff decisions, one responded that Bungie was not that type of company. Internally, the sentiment is only growing that the final shape needs to succeed for Bungie to avoid fur further internal turmoil. If the leaders are this bad, get them out. I think Sony needs to take over Bungie. I... I don't think I would have ever said that before. Leadership sounds so tone deaf in all of these reports talking about how like the good employees are still here and how, no, we're not that type of company that, that needs to take pay cuts. It's just like, get Hiroki Totoki in there. He's going to cancel all the knitting classes. And then, let the people who want to make games make games. I I understand that all of those bonus things are nice to have things, but right now it's time to buckle down, get to work. And like, that's the message leadership should be saying. Like, hey, look, we need to cancel all the extracurricular stuff. Right now, 
we have had a 45% revenue miss and we need to focus on what we do best, making amazing games. And I don't understand like, like, uh, are you willing to take consider taking pay cuts? Absolutely. Like if the leadership truly believes in Bungie, that would be their answer. Saying we're not that type of company. What even is that statement? It just makes me so disappointed to hear this from Bungie, a company I love and have covered for the entirety of my career. I started because I cover, I did a destiny three fan or a halo three fan video. I made a halo three fan video and that's what got me started. I won the contest. I bought a camera. I used that camera to film things and I would make more videos with that camera. And I used the rest of the revenue to get like, I put that money back into content creation. And that was back in 2006 and I'm here today right leadership is not being a leader leadership feels like it feels like leadership is squirreling around and punishing their employees for their failures so that they can keep their golden parachutes and then bounce out in 2026 that's what it feels like and that is depressing that's absolutely depressing. They are sending final shape to streamers with hundreds of subs. Really? I think right now they just need all the coverage they can get. There's a study out there somewhere that says if you watch your favorite streamer play a game and they're positive about it, the chance of you purchasing it is very high. I saw that study going around Twitter a few days ago. So then the Ziegler comment comes out. Bungie's marathon changing direction to a selectable cast of heroes like Overwatch. Who thinks the selectable cast of heroes thing is a good idea? I think it's probably a necessary design decision, but it's very concerning. If you think about it, Destiny is a selectable cast of heroes, and then you can customize to your heart's content. But being described that way is not what you think of. You think Overwatch, locked abilities. Because Destiny, you choose Hunter, Titan, Warlock, and then you get your bespoke abilities, right? In short, the core gameplay loop of Marathon is as follows. Choose your mission to complete in the game. Buy, choose your loadout, perks, abilities, gear. It sounds like Destiny to me. Drop into a server, hunt for loot, complete missions, explore and find secrets, extract, spend XP on updates, repeat. Honestly, like, I think it could be fun. And I'm, I'm definitely going to play Marathon, at least for a little bit. But if it isn't Escape from Tarkov levels good, they're doomed. <laughs> it has to be great. Both their games have to be great. They're kind of in like a, a, a do or die situation. And the leaders are just going to take over. It's just scary. It's a really scary time to hear about what's going on at Bungie. And all of this happened. Check this out. All this happened when we found out that the Destiny 2 Onslaught activity was revealed for Into the Light. What do you think about my statement? Do you think leadership should have just been more direct? With, with the staff, like, hey, we need to get rid of all extracurricular. Like, before you have to get to firing people, take every other opportunity you can to cut costs. Make sure that spending or, like, expenses are in check. Make sure that all extracurricular activities are canceled. Let the staff know we are still going to respect a healthy work-life balance, but you need to come in every day and we need your eight hours focused on making an amazing game. We are making these decisions so that we don't have to fire people. The rumors that were reported said there was no indication layoffs were coming, even though that they were asked directly about it. And then they just canned a hundred people like out of the blue. 
that is what was reported. And we've seen notable people from the studio just leave. It stinks. Whatever is happening stinks. And the rumor continuing to go on to say that leadership is basically holding on as long as they can so that they can keep their golden parachutes in 2026 is gross. It's gross. Thanks, 4K. Anyway, and then like, what are the actual people the studio doing? They're making an onslaught activity that was highly regarded. People people thought this looked cool. And it's just overshadowed by yet an, more drama from leadership. It's really, really unfortunate. And I think this is a good time to jump over to the Larian news. Because Swen Wink just talked about the following. Check this out. He talked about the current state of the industry. Swen is pissed off. Swen Wink, GDC 2024. Greed has been effing this whole thing up for so long since I started, Vink said. While collecting the GDC Best Narrative Award for Baldur's Gate 3, I've been fighting publishers my entire life and I keep on seeing the same, same, same mistakes over and over and over. It's always the quarterly profits, he continued. The only thing that matters are the numbers and then you fire everybody and then the next year you say, shit, I'm out of developers. And then you start hiring people again and then you do acquisitions and then you put them in the same loop again and it's just broken. You don't have to, Vink went on. You can make reserves. Just slow down a bit. Slow down on the greed. Be resilient. Take care of the people. Don't lose the institutional knowledge that's been built up in the people you lose every single time. So you have to go through the same cycle over and over and over. It really pisses me off. Larian's amazing. He just says what everybody in the industry is feeling. It's and it's so refreshing to hear it. And Cromwell said, punk band. <laughs> uh, Wink's right though, right? All of these companies care so much about their profit margins. And Wink actually posted a, a follow-up here. I don't know why my DMs are open. It's weird. For the avoidance of doubt, there are plenty of people in publishing I met who have their hearts in the right place. This message was for those who want to try to double their revenue year after year. You don't have to do that. Build more slowly and make your aim improving the state of the art, not squeezing out the last drop. And respect the people making the games. You'll find it brings you more joy. That's the problem. They don't care about that. These companies, the people making the games care about making great art. The problem is the people who run these companies don't care about that. They care about money. They care about money. And if they don't hit their targets, what happens? The people who care about the art are punished. And we lose people who are really good at their jobs. Publicly traded companies and huge profits was the worst thing that happened to gaming, Destin. I have said this for a long time. I've said it for a very long time. I think the industry, after the Activision acquisition, is going to go through a reset point. And it was going through a reset point because money was cheap. Everybody was buying everybody. Sony was buying Bungie. Microsoft was buying Activision. They bought Bethesda. Why were those companies looking to sell? They were looking to sell because they couldn't sustain their businesses anymore or they wanted out. Like Bethesda needed help. So they sold to, to Microsoft. You think Bethesda didn't shop around? If PlayStation had the money, they absolutely would have bought Bethesda. If PlayStation had the money for Activision, they absolutely would have bought Activision Blizzard. There's no way that wouldn't have happened. Perry says, any thoughts on EA and WB not seeing any value in single player games while Xbox and Sony continue to make them? Should studios go back to making 10 to 12 hour games instead of 30 hour, $300 million ones? I think there, I think that's a, a layered question, Perry. I really do appreciate it. So I think 
WB is stupid. I have no idea what they're doing. They just made a Harry Potter game that was massive. Make another Harry Potter game. They made like a billion dollars on Harry Potter. That's insane. When you break even at two, three hundred million dollars on a game and they made a billion, you're telling me you made seven hundred million dollars profit on the game. Games cost about three hundred million dollars to make. We know that because Sony's reports say that Spider Man was like three hundred million. Okay, so you made seven hundred million dollars on Harry Potter, and you you made Rocksteady release Suicide Squad, and it, like when people are when I'm trying to warn you and say like, hey, I think this game's bad. I never. I like don't do that during a preview. So, yeah. Here's what you need to do with Harry Potter. They want to do like a live service model thing. Make that a very small part of the game. Helldivers was not successful because of the live service aspect of it. I don't I don't believe it was like it's a multiplayer game. You go in and you shoot bugs. It has like a really good theme. It has really good gameplay loop. Like everything sort of gelled together. In a, in a really fun way. That did not happen with Suicide Squad. Make a Harry Potter game and make it so that you can play with friends. That's I think that's all you really need to do. That That's my, my hot take on that. And PC did carry that game. Yeah, it was also multi-platform. So like make Hogwarts, make like Quidditch multiplayer... And then you've you've met your shareholder needs, but like I don't know, I think they're just gonna drive everything into the ground. If, if they if they continue making like just terrible decisions, like they have been, I I don't see it going great for them. And if you look at what Larian's doing, so Larian's not planning a Baldur's Gate three DLC or sequel. Mink's message, which was delivered on a panel GDC, was relayed by IGN. It was confirmed that Larian Studios won't have anything to do with Dungeons & Dragons moving forward and will let Wizards of the Coast handle any further production in that universe. Instead, Larian Studios will pivot to focus on something new. That's great. I don't think we need more Baldur's Gate 3. Um, they are continuing to add support where I think we're going to get cutscenes for every possible ending of that game. So that's, that's awesome. Kyle says, we're at a point where games kind of either need to be smaller or multi-plat to make a profit. Look at what's being successful. How big is the team behind Last Epoch? Last Epoch has... How many developers are there? 11-hour games staff. Fifty-one to two hundred. How many employees work worked on Diablo Four? Nine thousand one hundred and sixty-seven. Huh, that's interesting. So Diablo Four, nine thousand one hundred and sixty-seven. Last Epoch, uh, fifty-one to two hundred. Who do you think had a higher profit margin based on those numbers? Well, Zoom Info says they only have 25 employees. I don't know what PLN is, but uh, 250 PLN. Thank you, Losi. Project mismanagement will have to end now. That population is expected to keep falling down. No money for mistakes. PS, Xbox count on third-party titles. But who is even making games anymore? Ubi's collapsing. EA creatively bankrupt, etc. I, I, I think EA's had some pretty good stuff this year, actually. There's problems with the A in terms of quality control, like the Star Wars PC version was really bad at launch. But uh, we also got uh, Dead Space this year. Uh, Ubisoft has had a lot of misses, but they do have games that are ongoing. I think the Assassin's Creed game was profitable for them. Ubisoft is having a lot of internal problems, though. I, I do agree there's a lot of problems, but I don't think it's quite at the point where everything's collapsing. Losi, but I hear you. I, I hear the frustration. 
Capcom is doing great. They're shoving as many microtransactions as they can into the Dragon's Dogma. By the way, that whole the whole drama about the Dragon's Dogma thing is really interesting. So Dragon's Dogma apparently has just like tons of microtransactions that you can buy, but you really don't need to. Like a lot of them are, and I watched uh, Asmongold talk about it. I haven't played enough. Like I never even would have ever bought the microtransactions. So I didn't even think about it, honestly, but it was it was a big topic at launch because there's so many of them. Uh, that sucks. Do they need to be there? No. But when you say stuff about like fast travel and then you have a microtransaction for it or for the, the resource you need to make the micro or to make the fast travel thing, it's a little ridiculous. Yeah, so... Crom up continues about corporate greed. If you look at what's happening in our industry, be it in the creation of games or games media itself, I think it's about time we all accept it's okay to say, actually, I don't think you know what you're doing. I don't think you have a plan for us. Start planning. Learning Studios boss and Baldur's Gate 3 director Sven Wink has blamed corporate greed for the high number of mass layoffs in the video games industry. Crom up. Yep. This guy doesn't miss. Like he calls out everybody and I it's just so nice. <laughs> it's just so nice. He says he wants he's excited to go back to work, etc. Salute Destin. Chat Destin told me to tell you all just remember to remember Halo 3 ODST is number 1 and remember to just remember. Okay. Well, I'm terrible at remembering, but I do know uh, ODST is pretty good. I agree, Retro. Needing to put in microtransactions is weird. Had a lot of time to reflect on this incredible adventure, and as everyone has, and I can't explain how excited I am for what's next. Hope you join us for that. Shout out to the hungry legend that is Mr. Vink, a wonderful man who wants to go, 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 let's go. Yeah, they're going away from Baldur's Gate. They're doing something completely new. And I am very excited to see what they do. Yeah, so... Uh, what was this one? Dragon's Dogma about the microtransactions, by the way. So we're talking about corporate greed, the Sven Wink comments. We covered off on the Bungie news. We talked about all the Xbox stuff. Did I miss anything? Well, we're kind of on the corporate greed topic, so I'm going to go to this one, but we still have a few Sony things I haven't gone over. Uh, the Capcom team actually don't ban those people, uh, Clay. That's okay. They, they're they totally fine to talk about that, but yeah, just don't ban them. But uh, I can't really talk about that, Yomero. Obviously. <laughs> So here's what here's what the Capcom team said to Dragon's Dogma 2 players on Steam to all Dragon's Dogma 2 players. We would like to update you on the status of the following items about which we have received numerous comments from the community to all those looking forward to this game. We sincerely apologize for any inconvenience. So if, if you're out of the loop, Dragon's Dogma does not run well on PC. It's CPU heavy. It's not really well optimized. And they have all these microtransactions. This is what they said about it. Crashes and bugs fi bug fixes. We are investigating fixing critical problems such as crashes and freezing. We will be addressing crashes and bug fixes starting from those with the highest priority in patches in the near future. The option of starting a new game. We are looking. You can't start a new game in, in Dragon's Dogma 2. It's one of the first things that I tried, by the way. I tried to make a new game. They don't have save files. And apparently, I this is a rumor, but if you modify your save files, I've heard that you get like me. <laughs> it's so stupid. I just want to start a new game and have a second character, right? You can't do that with Dragon's Dogma 2. It's insane. There is not a microtransaction for that Carolina gamer. There's no way. Um, we are looking at adding a feature to the Steam version of the game that will allow players that are 
already planning to restart the game. We will announce more details as soon as we can. You want to talk about not having basic features at launch and Dragon's Dogma 2 is a super fun game. I love Dragon's Dogma 2, but what? Are you crazy? Paid DLC. All the items listed below can be obtained in game or as paid DLC. Art of Meta. More, basically all the stuff, right? So they're just like, hey, it's fine. You can get all that stuff in game. And they're right. You can, but it's a little ridiculous. And by the way, I do see everybody over on Twitch. Hey, Luke and everybody. Good to see y'all. Thanks for hanging out. Regarding frame rate, a large amount of CPU usage is allocated to each character and calculating the impact of their physical presence in various areas. In certain situations where numerous characters appear simultaneously, the CPU usage can be very high and may affect the frame rate. We are aware that in such situations, settings that reduce GPU load may currently have a limited effect. However, we are looking into ways to improve performance in the future. Come on. You can't start a new game. You can't make a different save file. If you go into a town, your whole system tanks and you guys watch me build this PC and my, my PC can't even handle it. It's stupid. Let's look up Dragon's Dogma 2. I'm going to just type in Dragon Dogma 2. I want to see all the DLC for the game. Yeah, I was born in 1905. That sounds good to me. Um, here it is. Here's all the add-on content. <laughs> Here's all the add-on content. The Rift Crystals, $5. Look at this. Did they add icons? It looks worse with the icons, if I'm being honest. They got a bunch of 99 cent trans. Oh my God. Oh, and then they have the free-to-play character creator. This is dumb. Do not buy these. What are the top sellers? The port crystal warp location marker. So if you sort by top sellers, it's this and it's the rift crystals and art of metaphors, the character editor, you can do that in town or to barber. So the number three top seller is you don't need that. You literally don't need that. You don't need to buy the camping gear. <laughs> These are the top five sellers and it's like rift crystals and port crystals. So you can warp back home, which you can only buy once. God emperor says, I believe this is the one you can only buy once. And then like th you can just go to a barber. It can only be you. It can use be used only once. Wow. Anyway, that's so people are a little upset about that. And it sucks. You know why it sucks? Because Dragon's Dogma 2 is an awesome game. It is so fun. There are moments in Dragon's Dogma 2 that are so cool that just happen organically. Like a griffin randomly attacks you while walking through the woods. And I, I love that stuff. It's just super unfortunate that it's sullied by all these microtransactions. Um, I got to close some tabs. Real quick. Oh, um, <laughs> Moxie sent me a clip from Dragon's Dogma 2. All right. So, Swen Wink continuing to be based. We went over all the Xbox stuff. I might do something about that dev kit story. That's kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. We got a few Sony stories. Some of it good, some of it bad. We talked about the Bungie story. Wow, man. I had a lot going on today. We're not even through the news yet. All right. So we got a few left. <laughs> uh, check this out. Let's go back to Sony news for a second. Let's check this out. Sony reportedly stops PSVR 2 production to clear the current backlog. Sales for the headset have also allegedly dropped every quarter since its launch. When you don't make any new games... For your very expensive headgear. Yeah, of course it's not going to sell. Like, seems obvious. Anonymous says, hey, Destin, jokes apart. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we got Halo 3 ODST remake? 
That would be wonderful, right? Ask the chat. I, I would like that for sure. But right now we're talking about how PSVR 2 is a, is a huge failure. Y'all might see my sweats or my tummy. Ah, I forgot that was up there. Don't buy this. <laughs> I, t I got it for work and I still haven't opened it. Sorry, Ronnie, if you watch this mod. I've used my backbone more than I've used uh, my PSVR 2. You know, the one thing that is worth buying a PSVR 2 for is GT7. Gran Turismo 7 on PSVR 2, I've heard is great. That's the whole reason I asked Ronnie for the PSVR. And then they were just like, yeah, we're not going to we're not going to support it anymore. So rip. It's not mine. It's IGN's. Uh, Sony Interactive Entertainment has reportedly halted production of its PSVR 2 to clear its current backlog of on-sold devices. Ironically, the portal, which I think online you see a lot of people roasting and, and just saying is kind of a bad product, is selling well for Sony, according to the articles that I've read about it. So I've heard a lot of positive things about, about PSVR 2. And how well it's doing. Being to the barber, you can't change appearance, but at the legendary Riftstone nearby is a pawn selling items for RC 500. It will let you change appearance of Arisen and, and pawn. There you go. Tried VR once, threw up, never again. I, VR is like just, I just don't think VR is ever going to catch on. I think it was smart of Xbox not to get into VR. I'm not a VR fan. I don't see it becoming like a staple. In happier news for PlayStation, I did want to talk about this because I think this is something that I hope Microsoft also does. So this is a situation where Jade Empire would be a great remaster, Luke, where I would hope, I would hope, hope, hope that this continues throughout the industry from everybody. Sony's new Brazilian production line will provide physical PS5 discs for Latin American players, meaning PlayStation has opened something in brazil i believe so that they can produce playstation 5 discs so that people in brazil can buy physical media to play their games and own their games and i've heard that lat am is an area that like really really needs that type of functionality or that ability to just buy a physical media and it's been much requested so uh, this is a huge win for playstation in my opinion <clears throat> to ensure maximum efficiency in the production process, a team of experts from Sony Interactive Japan spent weeks in Brazil working on installation programming and training local staff. The initiative reinforces the commitment to Brazil and the Brazilian community. Big old W for PlayStation on this one. You're next, Xbox. There's no reason to eliminate physical media entirely, especially for places that are more, more impacted than others. And Hey, do you remember Connie Booth, the Connie Booth that PlayStation let go in October? Guess where she's going? She's going to EA former PlayStation executive, Connie Booth, one of the chief architects of PlayStation's first party strategy before her unexpected departure in 2023 is joining EA to help lead its studios amid its ongoing restructure. Booth's title will be group general manager action RPG with a portfolio that will include EA motive, Iron Man, cliffhanger, black Panther, and Bioware dragon age and mass effect. She will report directly to EA entertainment head, Laura Mille. Hell yes. Everything I've heard about Connie Booth is positive. She, let's just read the statement. Connie spent more than 30 years helping Sony build Sony Interactive Entertainment's internal studios and is responsible for guiding the development of some of their biggest franchises, including Marvel's Spider-Man 1 and 2, The Last of Us, Ghost of Tsushima, Uncharted, Ratchet and Clank, to just name a few. She said in a statement released to IGN. She is known for having created an incredible developer-first culture and supporting creative vision while driving innovation. 
I have known Connie for many years and have always been impressed by her love and commitment to games. She especially cares about game developers. She has an impeccable reputation within the development community and will undoubtedly have a positive impact on our games. This is why the earlier comment about EA being bankrupt or whatever, I think EA is a much, much better company than they were five, 10 years ago. They were the company where a dude had to put his hand in an ice bath so it would stop cramping up so that he could like code more or something. It was like, it was just ridiculous stuff that was happening at the studio, right? I think they have vastly improved from those days. And uh, WB has taken the mantle of <laughs> one of the most ridiculous companies in the industry. And then the last one, no, we have like two more about things related to PlayStation. And then I wanted to do a little reacts to the Unreal stuff. And then I think we're done for the day. What is the elevator pitch for a PS5 Pro opinion? Without the 4K upgrade to justify its existence, Sony's new hardware may struggle to explain itself to consumers. A few weeks ago, I wrote about the unusual situation we found ourselves in regarding console hardware with the Nintendo Switch on the one hand being seriously strained by an overlong tenure, despite being pretty low powered when it launched. While the current Xbox and PlayStation consoles are technically into the latter half of their cycles, but feel much newer due to the ripple effect of pandemic era shortages. One update strongly rumored to be in the pipeline at that point was the PS5 Pro model which most people expected to see sometimes in mid-2025. The reality is that, I'm going to skip into this, but with some ex exceptions, the PS5 doesn't have many games that are pushing its limits. The advantages of a pro console will be harder to see as a consequence. Exactly. It's going to be a more expensive PlayStation 5. And check this out. There was a digital foundry analysis. I'm going to kind of loop these two stories together saying that GTA six won't run at 60 FPS on the PS five pro, according to what Ledbetter's predicting. So on my previous episode where I said, Hey, GTA five, like let's say it runs at 60 FPS and it has all these bells and whistles. GTA six, sorry, has all these bells and whistles for the PS five pro. Well, it turns out uh, it's actually not going to be enhanced all that much. So it becomes less of a selling point. So if you're just getting, what are you getting? You're getting like better 4k. And, and what's the price point of it? So let's do, let's do straw poll again. I'm going to ask you all a question. I'm going to, I want you to go, I'm going to create a poll here. Will you buy a PS5? Pro for GTA 6 still at 30 FPS. Yes, no. That that's the question, right? If if you get a PS5 Pro and GTA 6 still runs at 30, let's just create it. All right. Here we go. I'm going to post it in chat. I'm going to watch the results come in. Let's see what people say. This is just a straw poll. So like anybody can go vote. You don't have to sign up or anything. No. <laughs> one person. Who said yes? Who's the one person who said yes and why? Two. Let's see if we can get 50 votes so we can get some sort of barometer on, on where you're falling with this thing. So we're at 40 votes. 40 all right so 43 votes 44 votes 90 percent said no all right there's 50. four people said yes i just want to hear from people who said yes why why would you buy it i would actually be in the yes camp i want to know if somebody just say at destin i would buy it because Da, 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 da. Do we know if GTA 6 is CPU bound? I think all games utilize the CPU to some extent. And the argument is that the CPU isn't a huge upgrade. 
in the PS5 Pro. So no matter what the GPU is doing, it it wouldn't improve frame rate in a, in a good way. Yeah, so most people... GTA 6 was the big selling point because I'm a corporate shell. Okay, Hannibal. I hear you. Like I would need it for work. I would any sort of any sort of enhancement visually, like I would want to experience in the best way I possibly can. And if PS5 Pro is the only way to do that, then great. But what if Xbox? So there's rumors that GTA 6 is slipping further and further into an area where Xbox could easily have their console ready. Odd had said, I want the best version of the next round of Sony first party games. I could wait for the PC versions, but I am weak. Yeah. So most people are just like, I'm future proofing or like, I want to experience the game in the best quality that I possibly could. I absolutely understand that perspective because I'm exactly like that. So even if you have a PlayStation five standard, you would still have a choppier experience than you would on a PS5 Pro. I'm making assumptions, of course, but yes. I'm debating moving to PC. Yeah, a lot of people are just like, it's time to get a PC, man. All these games are coming out on PC. Exclusives seem to be dying. Even PlayStation is like coming out on PC faster and faster. Now that Hiroki to Hiroki Totoki is going in there right now, and he's a graph guy. So he's like, our graph isn't going up enough. We need our graph to go up faster. How could we do that? PC day one, do it now. That's my read on the kind of guy Hiroki Totoki is. Make graph go up. <laughs> he doesn't care. Is the graph going up yet? No, you're fired. <laughs> Bye, Hunchy. You know, you know why Bungie leadership's still there? Because they have a contract. If they weren't, yeah, make graph go up. Period. That he is a businessman, but he actually seems to care about the workers. I really, really like Hiroki Totoki. Everything I have heard from him, well. You know, <laughs> to be fair, they did just fire 900 people. So he is cutthroat. But he also does seem to care in a weird way. I don't know, man. Well, no, Jim Ryan, they made Jim Ryan call, like, cut, not call, uh, sh shut down the London studio, right? He went there and visited, and then he's like, yeah, shut it all down. So, like, his last act before he left was to gut even the most profitable companies yeah Hiroki Totoki is the kind of guy who doesn't care I I think he does care about the devs and he can recognize good work but at the same time he's like hey the graph's not going up so he's the exact type of person that I think Sven Vink is talking about hey I noticed the graph didn't go up this month who do we need to fire and it just like that's the solution it because to me it sounds like you need to fire pete parsons i'm i'm making an assumption that pete parsons is the one standing up in front of everybody jason jones is too like timid i have to imagine they are very unhappy with that swath of leadership at bungie right now because the layoffs happen uh, there's no indication that Sony said they had to do layoffs. Uh, and I don't think Sony agrees with how they're handling Bungie right now. And also they're, they're supposed to be the studio advising the live service games. And then hell divers comes along and they're like, well, Bungie didn't did Bungie help with hell divers. I'm going to Google Bungie hell divers. Nope, they didn't because the Hell Divers lead dev said, yeah, we'd be totally up for a, a crossover with, with Destiny. Uh, I mean, y'all don't really care about this, but Assassin's Creed is rumored to be delayed.
Assassin's Creed Jade, an action adventure game set in ancient China that has been under development for mobile for the last four years, will likely be released in 2025 instead of this year. Okay. Well, like that was a big story. Um, Remedy, Alan Wake 2, game of the year contender. Uh, their revenue fell 22.2% in 2023. They're behind control in Alan Wake. They publish all these games, da 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 da, da but uh, they didn't hit their goals for Alan Wake 2. They own the Max Payne franchise. Like, so they did Control. I think Control was a success and highly regarded. And they did Alan Wake 2. And I do really admire the fact that, uh, according to the team at Remedy, they stick to their guns, they are making their own decisions. They say that they're not being influenced by any out, sort of outside forces. And it's like, okay, but Alan Wake 2 missed. You didn't make your money back on Alan Wake 2. So it's great that you're sticking to your artistic vision. And I really do truly admire that. I am curious. Why don't they make something with mass appeal to... What's how do I say this? Make a bunch of money that they can sit on and then make passion projects. Like they can do control tour or whatever, but like I hope that they have something with mass appeal on the docket. Like, what would that be though? Like, what do they own the rights to? Like Max Payne, maybe? They need one for everybody. Well, uh I am what they have publicly said is that it was their internal decision with all of their games. They've, they've had complete creative control over how they choose to implement everything. So that's the public messaging that they're saying, right? So I am curious. So what, what didn't work with Alan Wake too? I think I have a copy of Alan Wake 2. I haven't touched it yet. There's too many other good games out there right now. It is a slow burn. It's like a story narrative experience. I've heard nothing but good things about Alan Wake 2. I've heard nothing negative about Alan Wake 2. I still plan to play Alan Wake 2, right? But I think it's niche. I think putting everything you have on the line for Alan Wake 2 is a strange decision. Maybe Alan, Alan, everybody's sort of getting into controversy stuff. I'm just talking, like, think about it from a business strategy perspective. I'm not talking about the controversy or all that stuff or, like, trying to figure out what happened. I just think Alan Wake 2 isn't a good title to go all in on. Max Payne, like a shooter with a slowdown mechanic, it's a little more action-y. Con, con, did Control do well? Control did well, right? People like Control. Did Control sell well? Control has now sold 4 million units to date across all platforms. That's up from 3 million recorded a, a year ago. And then three years ago, people were wondering if Control sold well. Here's what I found on Reddit. We don't quite require the same huge lifetime numbers as many other games with bigger development budgets. CEO uh, Taro Bertala told Games Industry, therefore... Even though Control didn't have chart-topping sales right from the get-go, we are in a good position with steady, steady sales. We always take the long view here. This is why I like Remedy, right? Remedy is willing to do whatever the hell they want. Like, they did that Xbox game. Um, I played it on stream not that long ago. They did that Xbox game that was, like, sort of niche, Quantum Break. It was sort of niche, but like I went back and played it. God, that game's still gorgeous. And then Alan Wake 2 comes along and Control comes along and they do all these cool things. But like they, I would love to see Remedy come along and have another smash out hit. And I, I think one of their early ones was the Max Payne franchise. Who owns Max Payne now? Did they sell to Rockstar? Rockstar owns Max Payne. That's why they never made another Max Payne. 
So maybe that money from selling Max Payne to Rockstar. Huh. Anyway. The only reason I brought up this story is because I wanted to just talk about how much I respect Remedy for sticking to their guns, saying this is the game we want to make. They make it and come what may. They believe in the long tail of their products. They think Alan Wake 2 will make up the gap. 22% is significant, but yeah. We're going to move to the reacts. I, I'm doing a little bit of a different reacts this time because we're going to be reacting to some really, really cool stuff that has been revealed over the last few days. And I think you all are, are really going to like it this time. Um, it's not like a hot take. It, we're actually going to be watching the Marvel 1943 trailer, which I thought was freaking fire. So let's do it. All right. So this is Marvel 1943. I got to turn off the overlay and stuff like that real quick Burp. all right so this is marvel 1943 i am super hyped for this game they're combing the streets searching house to house so this was revealed and we're going to watch the presentation also on the on real stage the technology that is on showcase here is supposedly in engine and if this is in-engine tech, it's insane what they have managed to accomplish. If they arrest you too, they will take you to their headquarters and you will not return. I'm more concerned with the six-foot cat man who's got claws that can cut through vibranium alloy. The facial technology that's being illustrated there, it looks like a movie. It, it's a movie. And it's all being done in Unreal. So they had the actors on set and everything, and it's just so, so cool. By my count, that makes two super soldiers loose in Paris. Three, counting you. And that's two too many. Some of that looks like gameplay. Like, to me, like, this looks like this could be actual gameplay of the game. I'll be there before the sun rises, before the Germans, before that American. The eye of force has been found. This is the only guy I think, like, his acting seems a little too camp. And this is, Amy yes, good call, chat. This is Amy Hennig, one of the best writers the video game industry has ever had. So I am and think about the time period 1943 like there's so much they could dive into from a storytelling perspective it's so good yeah this is this guy is the only actor in the whole piece where i was like eh, it's a little little hammy but we only see him in like one scene before that american that guy's the back black force has been found the eye of force has been found what could it be cap do you know <laughs> i don't know we, i need to see more scenes with him but that one i was like eh, maybe do another take please just stick to the rooftops be careful see that looks like gameplay again it looked like it slipped from the cutscene, and this guy like nails the vibe i'm really stoked the germans before that american the eye of force has been found <laughs> <laughs> this looks like this looks like Just it could be gameplay. Rooftops. Be careful, stun was on me. When am I not? It looks like a movie. It looks so freaking good. I am so glad that not everybody bailed on single player games. Better yeah, if I like tackle this one player. alone. You may encounter some obstacles. That won't be a problem. Gameplay. Our cat friend is definitely. I'm just saying, like, a lot of these scenes look like gameplay. Only here, too. By the look of things, he's not very far ahead. The American boy is right on your heels. Who the hell are you? If you wanted us dead, we'd be dead. So what do you want? Answers. Who's. Is that Shuri? 
Yeah. Stay out of my way. Stand aside. I do not take orders from anyone. I don't have time for this. Neither do I. Yeah, <laughs> it looks so good. So they're utilizing the technology of metahumans in, in uh, Marvel 1943, and it looks really, really good. Okay, so it's not Shuri. Yeah, okay, so this is like a different Black Panther than modern day Black Panther. This is before Cap got frozen in ice. So that's that's a good flag. So I don't know who this is it is it T'Challa? Is that like the king's name or is it like the last name? It's his father's father, probably, right? It's T'Challa's grandfather. Yes, that looks that looks correct. And man, that actor is awesome. This actor is awesome. This guy, I was like He's the only one I get a little bit of camp from, but these two are great. And I've never heard of these actors before. Who's this character? Does anybody know this character over here? Azuri? Is this Azuri? Who's this character and who's Trumpet Guy? Yeah, everybody's... <laughs> what if the trumpet's a key gameplay mechanic? I feel like this guy is part of the Captain America Battalion. So Captain America always rolled with a bunch of shoulders, uh, soldiers. And even in the original comics, there was like Bucky. I don't think that's Bucky. Uh, the Howling Comrades. Yeah, so this is from the movie. If we go back, so this is from uh, Marvel Cinematic Universe at Fandom. So there's like all these different types of characters. And he's always had like people from all aspects of the war. Who is this though? Who who are these characters? Anyway, if anybody knows who Trumpet Guy is, let me know. The Howling Commandos, yes. I don't know a lot about Cap from World War II era. I just know Cap. Um, Happy Sam Sawyer. Here's here's some of the characters that were from the movies, right? So let's just go through these together. Um we got Captain, of course, Bucky, Dum Dum Duggan, Gabe Jones, and he was in the era. He's from Georgia. He studied German and French. Well, I th I think it's Gabe Jones. That'll be my guess. There's also Happy Sam Sawyer, but he looks like a naval. He's an officer of the United States. Oh, he's a ranger and a member of Nisei Division. I mean, if it's a movie character, then then my bet would be it's it's uh it's Gabe Jones. Because he worked in intelligence, right? Well, fighting alongside Bucky Barnes and Dum Dum Duggan from the 107th. Jones was captured by Hydra and placed in a cell with other allied prisoners. Like that background gives a lot of uh, story. Anyway, there's a lot of characters they can be pulling from. If anybody knows, let's Google it. Who are the characters in Marvel 1943 game? It's I called it. It's Gabe Jones. <laughs> the trailer focuses on Captain America and Black Panther. Along with a first look at other playable characters, Gabriel Jones of the Howling Commandos and Nanali. So, wow, my guess was perfect. Look at IMDb. Sorry, everybody. IMDb, Marvel. I can't super chat. It's all right. Uh, all right, here we go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, I was right. I mean, I'm kind of proud of myself for getting it right. Uh, we got uh, Kari Payton. We got, I don't know who that character is. Nanali is Megalyn something. Howard Stark's in the game. Oh, <laughs> this is going to be so good. Uh, Gabriel Jones. 
uh, Marquis Richardson and Drew Moreland did the voice. What is uh this guy done? Oh, he's an invincible. Teen Titans Go. So he has a long, long history of working in, in voice. This character did. She was in MK11. She's done a few video games. This guy has been in these films. Do I have anything jump out at me? Nothing I've seen. Drew Moreland. Bloodline Kelly. Anyway, I think. Sorry. Game looks fire. The, the game. That's what the kids say these days, right? I think that this game looks freaking awesome. So Nanali, Gabe, Black Panther, obviously, and Cap. Sorry. Nanali, Gabe, Black Panther, Cap. Sorry, chat. Carrie uh, Payton has been in everything. Look it up. Justice League. Okay. 2025. Is there a stinger? No, no stinger. And I got to watch that Ants Canna video. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look at the tech. Do y'all want to? I'm, I'm very excited about Welcome the technology here. to Pandora. My 1,000 gallon oh. cloud rainforest vivarium, a personal biological okay. project. We're not doing a reacts to the Ants Canada episode where he got infected by mites, but if you don't watch Ants Canada, you absolutely should. <laughs> right, what's going on here? The kids are like melting down. I might have to end the stream. Uh oh. It's here. my pleasure to introduce one of the greatest storytellers in video games, my good friend, Amy Hennig. Amy, come on out. Thank you, Kim. Uh, and look, we are so excited to finally show what we've been working on at Skydance New Media. Um, and I just got to say, I am so proud of what the team has accomplished. My God. It's incredible. Right. Right. Um, Amy, I'm sure the audience is wanting to know more about your game sure. and the team. Can you tell us about it? Sure. Well, I, as the trailer hopefully illustrates, uh, we are creating a story-driven World War II era Marvel action adventure game with an ensemble of playable heroes. But here's what's important to note. Mm -hmm. People might not think this. This isn't some custom demo that we made just for this show. That's our game. That is your right? game. Right? All the sequences you whoa, just whoa. saw in that trailer are all pulled right out of our game, running real time in Unreal Engine 5. All those are in game. Everything we saw in that trailer is in game. That's what she's saying. That wasn't like a rendered cutscene. That was gameplay. In engine gameplay. Wow. I've no smoke and mirrors. Yeah. I'd expect nothing less from your team. It's <laughs> absolutely incredible. Yeah. Um, as with many of your past projects, That's you're really nuts. bridging the gap between films and games. But this is a whole new level. What's different nowadays compared to the old days? Yeah. Well, look, I mean, you and I have known each other for what? Over a decade over now? Over a decade, yeah. Right. And we immediately hit it off. And I think it's because we've been chasing the same dream, right? Yes. Which is to create richly interactive experiences that are cinematic, immersive, but and it make you feel like you're in a movie, but with all the player agency that you expect from a really great game, right? Absolutely. And in the past, this has always felt like it was just beyond our grasp. But I think we're finally crossing that threshold. Yeah, we're trying our best. Yes, we're trying our best, yeah. Wow. And look, when we're telling a character-driven story, it's critical for us to be able to really faithfully capture and honor every nuance of our actors' stellar performances. And you, and you know what? I, that's the thing that blew me away the most. Like I'm, I, I was talking about that one actor where I felt like it was a little campy. The only reason I picked that up is because every little nuance of their facial animation was captured. I think Cap nailed it. I think the the lead actor who's playing Black Panther absolutely nailed it, and everything about it just looks so freaking good. I I am very very excited for whatever this uh, Marvel 1943, and it deals with Hydra. Like man.
So we've been incredibly grateful to be able to partner closely with our friends on the MetaHuman team to tell our story. Tell us a little bit about the visuals in the game. Well, again, thanks to Epic and the Unreal Engine development team, we've been able to leverage some of the new Nanite and Lumen features being released in the 5.4. And honestly, this is really helping our, our team to achieve a level of visual fidelity that enables us to present this authentically grounded Marvel universe. OK. No. All right, well, let's go a little bit deeper and see some of these features that the team has used by firing up a level in the game. So, let's, uh, let's <laughs> so that. Sounds good, OK. First, I'd like to introduce two of my colleagues, Colin Hennan, our Cinematic Animation Director. Yay! OK. And Roman Adiola, our Director of Photography. Oh, yeah, this is where they actually are going to be utilizing. So Colin will be live an editor, and Roman will be on the virtual camera, just like he is at all of our performance capture shoots. So if you all are ready, let's switch the feed and go back to that bridge environment. And let's see, yep, you're live, good, OK. So he's in engine, and he's utilizing this rig to move around while in engine to show off what their engine is capable of. That's nuts. So Colin, let's boom down and take a closer look at this environment. So to create a really immersive game experience, the characters and environments have to work together harmoniously. We can't just drop believable characters into a less than convincing world. So we need to start with authentic and densely look detailed environments snow. as the setting to our story. The snow looks and look, so And look, because part of our story is set in 1940s occupied Paris, we needed the word world to have a really believable and visceral level of detail and grit as you can see here. So, Roman, why don't we focus on the ground here for a bit? Yeah, let's look at the dirt. <laughs> now look at that. That's an amazing amount of detail. It would have been nearly impossible to get something this complex to run in real time without the new features in 5.4. Think, think about what they're utilizing here to paint the picture of whatever's going on on the ground. Um, they got these, these twigs, they got the dirt, they got the water here. Like, everything just looks so, so cool right now. Um, I need to step away for a second. I need to figure out why the kids are upset. It sounds like my wife got it. So, Kim, let's talk about some of the levels of detail that we're seeing here. Sure. So, we're talking about Nanite's new... No, okay, I'm going to step away for one sec. Be right back. So, update, uh, the kids spilt milk all over the floor. That's what happened. <laughs> I have a really sorry, I have to go check out my kids' macro setup on most games. <laughs> That's a good macro to get. Uh, my wife has it under control. I just, yeah, gaming down 100%. This is why I don't really do the streams. Let's finish this out, and then I'll, I'll go help with 
whatever, whatever needs helping with. Adaptive tessellation feature. So whilst Nanite lets you create environments like you're seeing here of incredible detail, the memory requirements can become impractical to realize for such a level of complexity across a huge level. Without Nanite allows you to sort of like paint stuff on the, on the ground and such. The need for lots of instancing. And we thought that was a challenge and we wanted to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, so Colin, let's actually strip this scene right down to the dirt so folks can see what we're talking about. So, oh wow. See how simple, this is relatively simple ground plane. Actually, let's, um, let's show the try. I, I don't know if y'all find this interesting, but I find this stuff fascinating. I think it's so cool. Unreal Engine 5 is really, really neat. Triangles, you can actually see what's there. Just a few hundred triangles. Let's pop it back to the beauty render view. Um, but with this new dynamic tessellation capability, we can actually displace that simple geometry and create new three-dimensional geometry. Somebody mentioned Gear 6. Yeah, uh, Colin Penty kind of gave a, a nod and a wink about Gear 6, by the way. He's like, yeah, who... <laughs> Who can't, we can't wait to show you Gear 6, basically. Of the quality that you're used to with Nanite. With nothing more than layering tile textures and using shader logic, you can make incredibly complex effects. So instead of me trying to explain it, <laughs> let's get Colin to show the magic and uh, yeah. let's see a transformation of this face. This technique wow. allows you to see an unprecedented level of geometric detail, but it's also memory efficient and can be changed dynamically in the runtime of your game. So things like footprints or tire tracks or even supernatural effects wow. if you such want, some would want them can be visualized. And just to show how this ge simple geometry has now been transformed, let's have a look at the triangle view again. There you go. What you expect from Nanite. <laughs> so it's a really, really smart, interesting technique to actually get details in your, into the games it's without magic. crazy, crazy amounts of geometry. Let's switch it back to the uh, detail view. Thank you. Um, and insane. of course, as you can imagine, this technology isn't just useful for the ground and for the ground terrain. It applies to every detail in the environment. I bet you the Gears team, like Colin Penty and all those people have been helping with stuff like this. And they're going to utilize it. And they're going to utilize it for uh, their future projects. So let's fly over to that pile of objects on the left over there, for example. And Colin, while we do, can you kill those headlights for me? Cool. Thank, thank you. Okay, so imagine our challenge. Wait. We're trying to Colin. authentically recreate a harsh winter in occupied Paris. That means from that every to this prop, retro, right? every object, every detail, every rooftop needs to be realistically blanketed in snow. So now let's show how we can dial up the, the snow accumulation. The, the snow honestly was the first thing I noticed. The second I saw the trailer, I was like, that snow looks really good. I know it's a dumb objects. thing to latch onto. All right. And of course, we can dial it back as desired. It's making me feel chilly, actually. Yeah, actually, it's a little cold up here. Well, maybe she's um, uh, <laughs> And remember. So imagine you can utilize this technology to take a scene and then like say, OK, well, like this much time has passed. So slowly let the snow amount increase and so that all the objects are covered. But then what happens if there's interaction on those? objects? Of course, like Kim said, thanks to this technology, this is all actual geometry. So you can see how tools like these would really empower even a small team to art direct and set dress their environments dynamically. It enables our artists to create a series of layers in the environment and then build up the complexity layer by layer by layer. Now, speaking of set dressing, let's go check out that fire barrel over by the watchtower we saw earlier. Yeah, that's the one there. And let's turn on a light to really illuminate the smoke coming out of the barrel. Same. <laughs> Look at that. That's amazing. We could have never achieved effects this realistic in the past. Wow. So this is what we call a heterogeneous volumes. In the past, effects like these would be done with particle sprites. Yeah. But that's kind of a cheat that often breaks down and can look flat. It's nice from afar, but far from nice, as we say back in the UK. <laughs> um, so the smoke bill is it does. I can't tell if it's a looping animation, but apparently this is all like created in real time. So. Yeah, this is on Real Engine 5. This is Marvel's 1943. Uh, crazy so if we look at the glow of the fire on, as it dynamically illuminates the volumetric smoke, you can see that, that light transmitting through the volume. You can also see that the smoke itself is sh casting shadows onto the world, but I also itself. I about that. These volumetrics can also mix with more traditional. So it's shadowing on the bottom half and it's casting shadow down on the bottom. 
bottom left corner. Effects as well. So if you do want to put particles in there, fog, or even cards, you can do it. It all works in a, in a unified way. You can run the simulation, the, the smoke simulation, wow. in Unreal Engine natively if you want, or you can import open VDB data sets as sparse volume textures, resulting in film quality visual effects, volumetric visual effects, all running in real time that total, are totally responsible to responsive to dynamic lighting. Yeah, and it, it, it just looks incredible. Now, uh, of course, all of this is just to help us tell our story, right? And the story is nothing without great characters. So let's head back over to the bridge and catch up with Cap. Now, an essential part of any character's persona. Oh, yeah. So this is the bridge scene again, but they took the cap off of the actor so that you could see the actor. See, Clay, have a good one. A Marvel hero is their look. And it can be really distracting if the outfit doesn't look this is as a realistic video game. and believable as the rest of the world. Something. So you can see Cap's leather uniform fits just like you would expect in real life with all the correct... If you see Cap in a vacuum, I, I'm not sure what to think about him. But when I saw him like in motion, he's really he's a really good Cap. And so is the actor who plays the Black Panther. ...material properties and the complexity of creases forming as he moves. From a technical perspective, this is where we can effectively utilize machine learning. We can set up and run complex simulations in a package like Houdini so and import that data place, into UE. It. We then use this to train an ML model producing film quality deformations that run in real time. But none of this matters without great facial performances. So and they let's bring it. Azuri, T'Challa's grandfather, and our Black Panther. Okay, so. Chat, that's what you were trying to tell me. It's Azuri, it's T'Challa's grandfather, got it. Into this scene, this time with his mask off. But I know who you are, Captain. America's hero, dancing around in red, white, and blue underwear. That shield that you hide behind does not belong to you. So You are unworthy good. of it. Right, and as he pauses Caps here, Roman, why don't you go in really close and <laughs> really show everybody the detail that we have in these models. Um, it's, it's insane, wow. right? Like, Amazing. Uh, it's essential for us the to retain every nuance of the outstanding performance that our actor, Kari Payton, brought to Azuri's character. What you just saw there were untouched metahuman animator solves. Mm -hmm. So working with the metahuman process, we've been able to honor our amazing actors' performances and faithfully transform them into equally powerful digital performances. Now, of course, it all starts with the actor's talent, and we're fortunate to have it's two amazing. of our cast with us in the audience today. So I'd like to introduce Drew Morline, who plays Captain America. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! Not deep folk. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! I can't wait for this game. This game... It's from one of my favorite writers. It's using the best technology on the market right now. I'm very, very stoked for whatever this game ends up being. And, uh, and Kari Payton, our Black Panther. See, they hug, they're friends. They're not really fighting. <laughs> it's all good. Um, and of course, I want to take this opportunity to thank them and the rest of our wonderful cast for going on this incredibly crazy journey with us. Uh, and now, as a special treat, uh, let's take a look at the entire bridge scene that you saw earlier. But this time, we'll keep Azuri's mask off to really this showcase cool. what we can do when all this incredible talent and all these amazing features come together. Retro says in 2025, we're getting GTA 6 and this. Like, 2025 is going to be a year. Wow. But remember, this is running entirely in real time. Awesome. This is in-engine. That's far enough! Wow. I'm here on the business of the United States government. Yours is not the only business here. Stay out of my way. Stand aside. I do not take orders from anyone. Turn around, boy. Go home. Look, pal, I don't know who you are. But I know who you are, Captain. America's hero. Dancing around in red, white, and blue underwear. Says the man dressed like an overgrown house cat. That shield I that you it. hide behind does not belong to you. Got him with the house cat. You are more. unworthy of it. <laughs> I don't have time for this. Neither do I. They, they gotta have their. Yeah, let's go. 
That game, yeah, I am so sold on this game. It legit <laughs> looks like a movie, absolutely. It looks so, so good. I can't All in engine, it. and just to show there's no cheating going on, hey, Colin, can you show the editor and the sequence of timelines? <laughs> So it really is running on Unreal Engine. We don't, we don't cheat. Yeah. That's, that's, they've set the camera to shoot those, those angles. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. I've never seen performances in a video game that are so believable. Wow. I am. That game looks so good. Do you think they can, do you think Amy Hennig will finally have a game that doesn't get canceled. I, I hope so. Or if you don't know, like, yes, I always talk about legacy of Kane. She also like worked on uncharted. So if you're wondering about her, like, like what she has created, it, it, she's created masterpieces. She is one of the, the best in the business. And I, I can't wait to see this. Uh, I think I'm going to end the stream there, but y'all have been amazing. Thanks for, for going over all the news with me and for all the support. As I said, it has been a little tricky to keep up with things lately with the kiddos dumping milk all over the kitchen <laughs> periodically, but, uh, thank you so much. I am going to sign off for the day. Thank you so much to all of y'all for watching. Thank you to the members for supporting. I do greatly appreciate it. And I do need to get back to a regular cadence on the news videos, but at least we're sticking with the Sunday live streams and regular interview videos. Thank you so much for the support. Hey, if you like this channel, you can support by becoming a member. You can click that join button. I'm going to get out of here in the meantime. If you want to check out something cool, you can check out this video here and I'll see you for the next one. Bye for now, everybody.